Now, in November of 2021, the federal government announced that it will remove fuel subsidy and replace it with a monthly 5,000 naira transport grant for poor Nigerians. The Nigeria Labour Congress uh, responded to the news, resolving to hold a national protest on February the 1st of 2022, which will be against it. Now, the back and forth of, for the removal of subsidies did not, however, start today. Recall that in 2012, when former President Goodluck Jonathan announced the removal of fuel subsidies, there was, there was a massive protest in the country. This had increased fuel prices from 65 naira to 141 naira. A similar protest was held in 2000 when former President Olusha Gwambasanjo attempted to remove fuel subsidies, which he said cost the government $2 billion annually then. However, the fuel, with the fuel pump price currently at about 167 naira, which would be the new price, uh, is it the right move for our country at this point to go ahead with the fuel subsidy um, removal. What's well, running us to discuss this is Richard Inoyo, he's a financial analyst, and Andy Akpotive, who's a public affairs analyst. Thank you very much, Richard, for joining us. Um, Richard, yeah, can you hear me? Thank you for having me. Ah, great. Good, good, good. I can hear you. Great. Let, let's start by, you know, the situation. I mean, we have laid a foundation for um, the fuel subsidy removal, but then a lot of people like me, are still stuck at the 5,000 Naira monthly grant for poor people. How does this add up to the average Nigerian who's trying to understand what this means and why government has come up with this 5,000 Naira grant? Well, let me start by saying that uh, the government seems not to care about economic arguments. And there are those of us who believe that the argument is not about voice subsidy. The argument is about refinery. Okay, this is a country with over 70 uh, billion barrel of crude oil beneath our soil and water. And yet we don't, don't have functional as a refineries. And that is just quite sad. Okay, so the argument is not about voice subsidy. The argument for those of us on the other side is... How well have we been able to develop our refinery and to ensure that they're efficient? So this whole idea of voice subsidy and the so-called grants for transportation, for me, is just a distraction. Okay? Uh, it's like someone having his uh, roof leaking, and then someone is saying that you have to blame the rain for falling. So I think the arguments being made by the federal government is invalid. And it's sad because if we follow the paths in which the federal government wants this country to tow, in a country where you don't have constant electricity, where you have to rely on FOI to be able to power your commercial, industrial, and residential assets, that simply means that you have to rely on FOI. And if the price goes up, people will not be able to drive the business objective, and that will force them to leave. So if not for anything, our focus should be how can we build our refineries and how can we build more refineries and not the old idea of linking increase in price of FOI to FOI subsidy. So I think right now uh, it looks to me that FOI subsidy is not a metaphor to increasing the price of FOI, not necessarily addressing the fundamental reason why there's even FOI subsidy in the first instance. If we have our refineries working, we won't be discussing about FOI subsidy. So for me, the policy is just anti-Nigerian, it is draconial to the business environment, and is dangerous for the economic future of this great country. Now, um, a lot of people are saying that this, if the fuel price is raised to about 340 naira, which is some, somewhat the proposed price, uh, that it, it might worsen and shrink the GDP of the country. Can you say that to us in, in plain English? Well, practically, uh, that is just the facts, to be honest with you. Because one, when you increase the price of oil, what you're doing is that you're basically increasing the cost of doing business across the country, especially where uh, your energy uh, as a portfolio is very, very poor. Currently, there's no, uh, as a state in Nigeria, that can actually boast of generating sufficient energy to drive uh, the economy within the state. 
And that simply means by increasing the only one thing that everyone relies on to be able to drive industrial and commercial objective, that simply means you're going to be increasing the cost of oppression. And people would want to leave the country to countries like Ghana, where inflation rates is around 10.6%, and elsewhere where they can get cheaper as an energy for their industrial plants. That's one. Two, by increasing the price of oil, what you've done is to increase the cost of transportation. And we all know that for you to move agricultural produce from, let's say, Kano to, let's say, uh, a city like Calabar or Lagos, what that will imply is that you're going to increase the cost of transportation. So people will not want to do business, so they'll be forced to leave the business environment and to stay idle. So that in itself will impact negatively on the GDP of Nigeria. So the last thing we honestly want right now is to be talking about increasing the price of oil. That's just the truth about it. Mm. Okay, and it's sad to know that we have a president that seems to think otherwise and seems to be determined to frustrate the entire economic sequence of this country. So it's a big problem we have. Those of us who are saying no to oil subsidy, we're saying that because we know that we don't have constant energy in Nigeria. The electricity supply is still very uh, in as in efficient, non-reliable, and by targeting FOI and increasing the price, that simply means that people who run business won't be able to produce at a cost that is cheap. And what that simply I think that we lost that connection. We're quickly going to bring Richard back so we can wrap up the right incentive. Okay, I, we lost you for a second, Richard, but I have a quick question because of time. Um, now, economists have also okay, warned like the said, presidency. I, I, can you hear me? Yes, the economists have actually warned the presidency about the fact that we risk a social uprising of sorts. Um, but before we go into that, before I let you go into that, we have seen a lot of hardships lately. The cost of living is continually skyrocketing. I know many people who were unable to afford meals while we were celebrating the Yuletide. We've seen a lot of in economic migration from Nigeria to different parts of the world. I've heard people say anywhere but Nigeria. And the government's still saying, you need to tighten your belts. You need to, you know, brace yourself for what is to come. But um, the question is, where is the conversation on our refineries? We, we heard about the issue of modular refineries, but all of that has gone cold. What's happening to all these moribund refineries? Is, what exactly is the issue? Why can't we, all of these monies that we spend to uh, export the crude, refine it and bring it back into the country, which is making it a lot more expensive for us, apart, apart from the benchmark uh, worldwide. Why are we not having these conversations? Well, let me start by saying that we live in a country where accountability is a big issue. And people don't seem to think that for the fact that they're elected, they're accountable to the people. Let me be frank with you. I, I happen to be one of those who fought for the Potakot refinery to get a 1.5 billion US dollars needed to revamp that refinery. Sadly, a few days ago, we heard that a section of that refinery went up in flames. So the truth here is that it's clear that we are not even serious about revamping our existing refinery and building more. So that in itself is a very big problem. But in the second direction, I still think that it's very important for us to sustain the conversation around building more refineries. Sometime last year, we had the vice president talking about modular refineries, suggesting that by building smaller refineries across, as in the Niger Delta region, that will enable us to increase our supply and address the issue of oil subsidy and the rising cost of oil. But unfortunately, what we've seen is just uh, what I call rhetorics. We've not been able to see practical commitments towards that ideology that ensures that we can actually kind of refine our oil locally without necessarily sending it abroad and then losing foreign, foreign exchange earnings. So I think first, accountability is the thing. Secondly, I think the major problem here is that we don't seem to have leadership that is committed to addressing uh, some of this issue we are discussing currently. Until then, I still believe that Nigerians may just need to uh, live with this very sad situation of finding ourselves where argument is shifted from building more refineries into discussion around forest subsidy and transportation grants that basically we don't need. Um, finally, I mean, a lot of people had hope in the PIA, which is now the PIB, hoping that, you know, um, 
with the proposed regulation, we now hear that, of course, uh, the government is about to spend 900 million naira for subsidy in 2022. Just as you have said, th there's a lot of window dressing. In a time where the rest of the world is moving away from crude and going to renewable energy and green energy, we're still even ha finding it very hard uh, to even produce, you know, and refine something that we have here free of charge. Uh, it, it really bothers me what the future holds. Now, don't forget, the NLC is going to be protesting on February 1. This might cause a delay of sorts, but how long can we hold this off? If the government is saying they're being burdened, they're spending too much money, if we now decide that we're going to have to pay this much for our fuel, what happens to the other things? Because don't forget, I mentioned the cost of living is still pretty high. Um, transportation in this country is purely powered by these, you know, by fuel and crude energy. So where do we go from here? Is life going to be worse and get, getting worse and worse for the average Nigerian? Well, let me start by saying that uh, I believe Nigerians would rise to pose it. Because the truth here is that what that simply means is if we all don't come together to oppose this policy of government, what that simply means is that you, you're working for just the oil merchants. And that simply means you're being taxed heavily to get uh, the foil you need to drive your vehicle or to power your generator or to ensure that you keep as in yourself in business. So I suspect that Nigerians will rise and I don't like to think that uh, we get to the point where the government will list in and then our ship would increase. Okay, so I would suggest that uh, what the government needs to do right now is just to suspend our policy. And I see Nigerians coming together. This is not just about NLC okay. or the the, the, the the other trade union uniting to confront this policy and to defeat this policy. It's about all Nigerians coming together to unite and oppose this policy because it is not in the best interest of Nigerians. It's not in the best okay. interest of our economy. It's not in the best interest for energy development. And just like you rightly said, the world is migrating from uh, toxic energy, which we refer to as fuzzy energy, yeah. to green alternative. And here we, we have, have we can't even just address the issue of energy as in poverty. So I'm of the view that uh, Nigerians will unite uh, to, to defeat this policy and to force the government All to right. give up on this policy because the policy serves none. Well, we have to go. Thank you so much. Richard Inoyo is a financial analyst and, of course, he's been speaking to us about the fuel subsidy removal. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Richard. Well, that is where we say our goodbyes. But before we do that, we'd like to bring to you what Nigerians have to say about President Buhari's fight against corruption so far. I will see you tomorrow. I am Mary Anakon. and have a good evening. I would say, in my own opinion, he hasn't. That is the truth. Because corruption is everywhere. Even before he came, though, there was corruption. But even now, you literally find it in places you can't even think of to tell you how bad it has become. So to me, I would say, no, he has not. Yeah, Anti-corruption. Uh, well, so far, so good. He had tried to some extent, you know. Um, he's just one person out of many or uh, numerous people. So. He has actually tried his best, and I believe um, what we are experiencing is the best he could offer so far. Um, but in terms of other hacks and other area, he has uh, done remarkably fine. Probably in terms of um, projects and infrastructure, I think he has been doing fine. But when it comes to anti-corruption war, I'm just going to score him like um, on a scale of ten. I will score him like four, basically. And I believe it, um, um, it's basically because of the, um, the group of people that has been working with him, you know. When you are the head, you cannot come down and do everything yourself. So you have to, the people you put in place determine your success, the level of success you must have achieved at every point in time. Anti-corruption, so what is not tackling anything? We are facing challenges. Corruption, what is corruption? But you hear the language Oshomole said. He said, when you join APC, all your sins are forgiven. So what, so what, what is he tackling? I'm asking you. He's tackling, tackling But you had what, when Oshomole was a chairman, what did he say? He said, when you join APC, your sins are forgiven. 